All good? Um, yeah, please. Cool. Um, I will, like, I'm going to be pinning down the rest of my team. I basically got doodle, doodle poll information. Oh, for their oh, friends. Oh, yeah, we used to run that. Okay, so we want to take care of that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. I'll, I'll be in touch. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so we were starting to just put it on the floor. Okay. Yes, Jin. If you are not Jin, please be quieter so that I can hear Jin. Thank you. He just said be quieter. He didn't say shut up. Okay, folks, I'm going to slowly get started with the uh, the day's lecture here. Um, so, first things first, I've done a little bit of changing around of the uh, of the um, the syllabus, so I want to point that out to you. Okay, so okay, meeting meeting time over class started. That's okay. No, I'm, I'm I'm psyched that you guys are meeting. I just need to do my lecture now. Okay, okay. So. Um, as you remember or may remember in the syllabus, starting next week, um, things were going to start being due. And uh, you may not remember, but if, if there's something in a box here, I want it before that week starts, not during the week or after that week, okay? So originally, the draft product, product service prototype was due here. We've just finalized the group, so it's not possible to do that by by the end of this weekend. So I pushed that back to be due next weekend. And depending on how things develop with initial meetings with, uh, with um, Omar, with uh, Garrett, with um, continuing to cooperate, I'll, I'll tell you guys about the rest of the software groups in a little while. Um, Ryan, Ryan was sort of representing two here, but there's five other groups that have already picked their projects and I can explain to you guys what they are. Um, and what we need to do for next steps. The other group needs to pick a, a project, whether it's Derek's or something else, um, or multiple ones, um, and then um, shout. So depending on where we're at after initial group meetings next week, I may push the deliverables back again 
And if you remember, if you, you recognize, the way that I have the class set up is like lecture, discussion, lecture, discussion, lecture, discussion. So whatever you turned in the weekend prior, we discuss on Thursday and talk about like, okay, here's some common things that I want a lot of people to change about that deliverable, et cetera. So it's pretty easy for me to flip and just do three or four lectures in a row to give all of your groups more time to meet for a couple of weeks and get things together, okay? So, um, yes, the Jennifer. Entrepreneurial. Jennifer, right? Yes. That's what I thought, okay. <laughs> the entrepreneurial one? Yes. Sorry, I That's can't okay. say that word. Um, career plan thingy. Didn't you say that all of these were gonna have to be like, uh, like a couple pages long? Like all the things that we have to turn in? Just making that up. <clears throat> sort of. Let me let me finish point A, and then I get to point B, which okay. is what you're asking about. Okay. Okay. So, deliverable wise, what's important to me next is that you guys, like, I'm gonna, I, I have all of your availability. I'm going to send that all out in Doodle polls. I'm gonna input what you guys. In the future, I'll just send that to you. But I just figured out how to use Doodle finally, so um, I'm gonna input everything you guys told me. And then um, most important thing is that each of the groups meets in the next week. Now, if it's possible to have an initial mock-up of the prototype, I'd like, I, we need that sooner rather than later. The sooner we have, uh, the sooner we have like a video of a, a drone flying, or we have like a picture of, you know, here's where the solar panels will go, but it doesn't fly yet. As soon as we have some basic, like, photos or video and some text description of here's what's done here's what comes next same thing for irrigation the stuff that garrett showed us we want those pictures and whatever else he has the sooner the better you guys are already started on a website and a brochure so you really have nothing standing in the way of your prototype as it were um software is going to be a little bit more difficult because it's dependent on the, the code programmers and they need a little bit of time they just chose their groups like today and, and two of them haven't chosen their groups yet so that being said i'm going to push to have what, what are called wireframes uh, which is basically just a uh, a picture of what the app is supposed to look like when it works but all it is is just a drawing it doesn't actually have any code behind it i want those things sooner rather than later so but all of that is dependent on the group meeting and like dividing responsibilities and stuff. So I'm gonna email each group to coordinate about meeting times and stuff. And then we'll figure out when the prototype and the website and the customer analysis and stuff are the do. That makes sense to everybody? I, pu I pushed them back one week right now. I might end up pushing them back another week depending on how all the meetings go. Okay? <clears throat> okay, now. That being said, your entrepreneurial career plan, which is that email that I sent everybody, if you didn't get an email from me, raise your hand now. Can you repeat that, please? My mind is somewhere else. Okay. That's okay. Technically, I didn't get an email from you, but, but I have the email. As long as you have it, that's okay. fine. Okay. Uh, so um, that is due, I mean, that's, that's about one page or so. This is getting back to your question, Jennifer. So the deliverables, it really just depends on how long it takes. Um, a lot of them are gonna be in a format that we upload to the website. Okay. So it could be a PowerPoint document, could be like actual like Word, like mm -hmm. the, the amount of writing is less important in here than answering the questions that need to be answered for the venture. Does that make sense? That being said, what's due this weekend, your individual profiles where you're gonna like um, you're going to reflect on how you could improve some of your areas where you scored low on that test. Um, you're going to think about your um, uh, how you're going to build your uh, your mentors and support networks, and you're going to tell me about your levels of affordable loss and acceptable risk. That's just about a page. I I don't need any more than a page for that. I just you know if you need more than a page, go ahead. But I just want you to answer those three questions. Does that make sense? Okay. Just for the, yes. third, the third part of that, are you expecting numbers or are we just keeping it in a sense of like we want to live affordably but in a nice environment or something like that? Like, 
because I don't obviously don't Samuel. Yes, Sam. Oh, yeah. I was wondering what you meant. Like, um, do you know what I mean, though? Like, how is, with this the entrepreneurial career plan, that third part, do we get um, numbers and the figures for you to? Because I really haven't been able to do it. That's fine. I think the first thing I said was how long can you afford to go? To keep going, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so what I'm asking you, um, what I'm asking, like, what I'm asking each of you uh, in the uh, affordable loss and acceptable risk areas, affordable, like, acceptable risk, I just want to know what are you going to do to maintain your LinkedIn profile. So basically maintain your resume so that you're still developing skill sets and things that you can get employed for later. Um, as far as affordable loss is concerned, um, you know, I, some people are more sensitive about telling me their budget numbers than others. So I don't push on that. Uh, if you're uncomfortable about it, that being said, the more I know about your budget numbers, the more I can say you're headed for trouble or yeah, you're fine. You know, yeah. so Tell me how long you could work for 10 hours a week. And I'm talking 10 hours a week, and tell me what job you could do for 10 hours a week that would actually pay your bills. Now, if you want to also tell me what those bills are, great. Otherwise, I know that I know that it is possible to exist as a human being on between one and two thousand dollars a month. Um, Sometimes less if you live with uh, with relatives, or you live with friends, or whatever. I know what it would take for you to be able to like eat grape nuts every day and still survive. If you tell me a plan, if you tell me a plan for your career, uh, if you tell me a plan for how long you could work ten hours a week, and then in your professional development plan it also says like, I want to get like a fifty thousand dollar a year job next year, and I'd like to have like a really nice car within five years. Those don't match, you know? So tell me, the more numbers you can tell me, the better. That being said, what I need to know for affordable loss is, can you go for a year working 10 hours a week? Could you go for two? Could you go for six months? And what are you gonna do for 10 hours a week? You're gonna wait tables? You're gonna be, do like part-time accounting work? Like I know how much all of these things pay more or less, so you tell me what you think you could realistically do for 10 hours a week to pay the bills so that you have enough time to work on the venture and tell me how long you think you could hold out like that before you gotta just get a real job and, and be able to pay bills, okay? Does that make sense? And that is due this, the end of this weekend. Yes, Crystal. Uh, I'll just ask you after. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that. Huh? What if you have somebody that pays your bills for you? <laughs> but that's that's I, fine. I first of all, <laughs> um, mention it. You don't have to tell me all the details, but you can say like. I want to know the details. I have someone. I I have someone who like pays for the you know these expenses in my life. You don't have to say who it is. Then, um, that's, okay, folks. Um, one more thing before I dive into like continuation of last week's lecture. Um, so, uh, Abdullah uh, is not here. Um, Fahad, I still need your professional development plan. Did you never get that email from me? It's a it's a PowerPoint document asking like what your career goals are after the class. Do you remember that or not? The very first one. Okay. I'll, I'll email it to you. Come on in. Huh? What's up? Um, oh, they did. That's fine. Thanks for telling me, but go, go take care of that so you can come back. Okay. Um, I'll email you with what you need, okay? Um, Uh, Mohammed Alesa is not here. Um, Abdul Aziz, we talked about already. Um, I will email to you. Um, and then both of the uh, Abdul Rahmans. Um, I don't have it. So, yeah, can you send it again? Did you get the email or not? Huh? I just did it this afternoon, but I think I Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got it, but I was like, what is this? That's, can you send it again? 
But you guys got the email, right? Okay, send, please send them again, okay? Thank you. Um, and then Faisal, we talked about, Faisal, you're over there now. Uh, we talked about just, uh, I'll, I'll email you with what you need to send me, okay? Um, Antonio, have you sent me your professional development plan? Did you get that email though? It's like I sent it before class started. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you got it. So I need that and I need you to connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, just go to my website, go to my page and where it says like send in email, there's a little arrow. Click on the arrow and it'll say connect. Okay, just connect to me and then we're good. Um, Derica, have you sent me a professional development plan yet? Are you going to? Okay, good. Um, Nick, where'd Nick go? He was right there, wasn't he? Okay. Um, and then Lance, have you sent me a professional development plan yet? Uh, I, I I don't I can't find it. Can you send it again? Thank you. Um, but you got that email, right? You know what I'm talking about. And then um, Axel, same thing. Did I? I thought I forwarded that to you, right? You have? Can you send it to me? Thanks. Okay, that's that. Um, the last I'm going to go through the lecture, and then at the end of the lecture, the end of the lecture, everyone who is not software. It's welcome to go ahead and go. I want to give the software folks an update on what the rest of the project groups are doing. So Ryan is part of one group of four, and then there might be another group that's still looking for a project. Um, but everybody else has already decided, and I'm going to explain to you guys what the projects are that they're going to be working on, and what the options are for organizing uh, the teams, okay? So we'll, we'll talk about that. Hang on one second. We'll talk about that as soon as I'm done with the lecture. That way everybody else didn't have to wait on that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, you're going to talk to your teammates. Do you know any of them? OK, get to know them. Um, so, um, Britton, do you mind? I have, your, I have your contact information already. Can I give your kind of that information to her? And then you can ask. Brittany's right here. Wave. Um, contact her if I if I if I if you have to leave before I'm done, um, and then she can explain everything. Is that fair? Okay. Okay. So picking up where I left off with the lecture. I think this is where we stopped, wasn't it? Problem inventory analysis? Okay. Folks, if you're, if you're not me, I, I'm, I'm glad that the group is meeting. I just need to do my lecture now. Um, but in general, I'd rather you guys be talking with each other than me talking more. So it's good. I just need, I need not talking for about 20 or 25 minutes, okay? Cool. Thank you. Um, so, from current slide, um, creative pro like so we were talking last time about ways to generate ideas and ways to expand your mind as much as possible to come up with a, a truly differentiated and, and valuable, value added entrepreneurial idea. That's where we stopped last time when we talked about problem inventories and try to trying to go, go with an existing product and, and dump, do, a, do a brain dump of as many problems as you can think of with that product. So picking up from there, um, creative problem solving. Um, in, you know, we talked about brainstorming already, but the, in, in particular, there's another nice piece of, uh, of, of information that I, I wanted to add in here. You want to start in a brainstorming session with a problem statement that's not too broad and not too specific. If, if it's too broad, people don't know where to start in a brainstorming session. If it's too specific, then you're discouraging people from really free associating and coming up with better ideas. So 
Um, you want to have it right there in the middle. Um, reverse brainstorming. So in general, you don't want any criticism in brainstorming. Uh, reverse brainstorming as a technique, um, you want criticism, and you actually want to you want to answer the question: In how many ways could this idea fail? Uh, it may sound kind of negative, but um, it's actually it's it's a good way to identify things that need to be addressed, issues that need to be dealt with. And if you can think of any, if you can think of every possible way that an idea can fail, and you can think of ways to address them. Uh, you've probably got a good idea. So it's kind of a way of vetting ideas. Um, the Gordon method. Um, this is getting people together in a group where they don't actually know the exact nature of, of what the problem is or what, what the topic is that you're, you're brainstorming about. It's basically you're giving them a general concept that's associated with the problem and letting them discuss. So, you know, in the case of shout, that might be, you know, there's a lot of kids that have like tough time in their lives growing up. You're not specifically asking them about the need for another group home or the need for uh, the, the, the hybrid service that you've, you've been talking about now. But you're not talking about the specific services, but you're talking about the general area of children in need and then get them talking about that. It's a good way to generate more ideas for what Shout might be able to offer as services, things that you may not have thought about, about problems and resources and so forth, etc. Checklist method. Um, this is really forcing yourself to uh, forcing yourself to go with se se several related concepts or ideas, and 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 trying to force yourself to apply that uh, verb to the topic that you're you're studying. So, for example. Uh, put to other uses, adapt, modify, magnify, minify, substitute. All of these things have to do with sort of <coughs> adjusting or replacing something. Um, and if you force yourself to think of each one of those, uh, those verbs and then apply it to, for example, um, current uh, drip tape um, irrigation, um, you may think of things that the smart irrigation system needs to address that Garrett hadn't thought of yet, as an example. Like, ideally, smart irrigation system that Garrett's trying to develop should be, um, you know, the, the computer should be smarter than us. It should think of all possible problems that might happen, monitor for them, and if they happen, uh, address them in the optimal way. Uh, honestly, there's no reason why a human being ever needs to decide when water goes on and off anymore. Um, the more complex he can, he can build that system. So uh, one way of brainstorming things, but the computer doesn't know until you program it and tell it to remember these things. So a good way to identify things to program into that system is by using this method here. And then finally, free association, um, writing down one word and then after that, writing down another word that you think of based on that word and doing it in a group. Um, and each person tries to add something new onto the last word. So um, I think in particular, uh, that may be relevant for software apps as you're trying to decide what kind of functionality could it have to try and think outside the box and think of buttons and functions and so forth that no one would have considered uh, on the normal linear path. Free association is a good way to, to think about that. Um, more creative problem solving. Forced relationships. Um, this is basically similar to something I'm going to go over in differentiation in a little while. But um, you're basically taking particular elements of a problem that you know are important. So for example, um, with the drones, with the drones, uh, Omar's already said that one of the key problems is how to mount the solar panels properly on the, the wings. So perhaps you take solar panel. I, yeah, I don't know. Solar panel and flat surface and like force how many different ways could we actually get them to stick together? Super, super loop, looping one of them. Um, so 
another another way of, of brainstorming ways to deal with things. Collective notebook method is basically um, handing out notebooks to people with a particular problem to, to brainstorm or think about. Um, have them write down thoughts about it each day and then collect them after a week. Kind of allows for, uh, it's, it's sort of like an even more in-depth version of um, the brain writing method where you really have more time to think about stuff but you're still sharing ideas with the group. Um, attributive listening, um, or you're basically listing at attributes of a problem and then looking for uh, various viewpoints and then big dream approach. Uh, you can read that and this is the, 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 key, the key point here is to not worry about whether it's unrealistic to do something or not. Just dream as big as possible and then backfill and try and figure out how to make it happen. Uh, force relationships, like I, like I said, this is actually a brainstorm. This is a, this is a, a an exercise that uh, it's an exercise that consumer product companies like uh, um, Procter and Gamble used to go through. If you take paper and soap and force yourself to like associate those, you can associate them like as adjectives, as nouns, as like verb combinations, like just and and you know. Soaked papers. Well, this is this is kind of like, in some ways, this is the, like the idea of, um, of wet wipes and stuff, you know. Um, flakes. I mean, that's basically uh, a, a particular type of, a particular type of way of of, of delivering soap that um, isn't so popular anymore, but you know was was one way to do uh, did, like laundry detergent. Um, just, it, it's amazing the different ways you can repackage basic consumer goods, and just because you put it in a new package, people buy it when they didn't used to. So, this is a, another example, and that's not really relevant for in here. But um, if you just force yourself to associate two words with each other, two concepts with each other, sometimes you come up with um, you come up with ways to to address problems or address connections that you hadn't thought of. Um, so there's different types of innovation. Um, and I think, yeah. So there's everything I've been talking about in this lecture so far has been about ways to generate ideas. You know, they're really, um, they're really, um, um, individual actions to take to get to a new entrepreneurial idea. Starting with this page, I'm talking about um, sort of big picture again. How do we define and count and sort of keep score of entrepreneurial ideas and, 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 and plan what's going to happen to them next once you find a good idea and sort of make projections about how they might change society and, and the kinds of, uh, of reach that they might have with uh, with earning potential and so forth. And in that case, once you've come up with a new idea, uh, it, it tends to fall in one of three categories. There's breakthrough innovations, technological innovations, and ordinary innovations. So um, breakthrough innovations are things that come along once in a generation, and they truly change the entire society. So you know, human beings, our planet Earth, will never be the same like with an internet versus the way it was without an internet. It has changed everything about human interaction. It's changed our society. It's changed the entire planet. Um, technological in innovations, and a good example of that is, uh, is uh, jet engines, you know? Um, so flight, aerodynamics, there was nothing new about being able to fly, um, but a jet engine, as opposed to a propeller-driven aircraft, um, is sort of an order of magnitude faster and, and, and more powerful. So it's a major breakthrough, but it's not the kind of breakthrough that we use in big, like, capital terms. It, it moves flight forward considerably, but it didn't invite, it, invention of the airplane was a breakthrough. The jet engine is a technological innovation. And then ordinary, I mean, it's not so ordinary, really, because Spanx, how many people in here are familiar with Spanx? Like the shorts? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, do you know how that started? No. So, huh? No, the, it started because the, <laughs> it started be, it started because the founder, um, the founder didn't want, um, it, it, it started because the founder did not want, like, um, Candy lines. Yeah. And so she she cut off the feet of the of, of, of like regular uh, uh, like nylons and then realized, hey, this is actually a great idea for, for pants. So I mean she's made millions and millions and millions of dollars out of spanks, but it all started by cutting the feet off of, of nylons. Uh, and which is a relatively normal innovation. Uh, just because it's quote unquote ordinary does not mean you don't like become incredibly rich off of it. Um, moving from that into defining a new innovation, sometimes it doesn't have to be all that different, you know. Um, fashion G in the night, especially in the eighties, um, there's there's some different labels that are that are popular now, but you know, denim jeans have basically been around since the old west, and they're they're, they're they're durable. That's why people originally wore denim. Um, but like putting Guess on the back of it, putting Calvin Klein on the back of it, and making it like a fashion statement um, was was a like an invention that came along basically in the in the late '70s, early '80s. And it's the exact same jeans. I mean, that's a total normal invention, ordinary invention. But put put like a brand name on it. Put some like kind of fancy looking decoration on it in terms of how the, 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 the signature sign may be in, in, in something about the quality, but it's, it, they're jeans. They're just jeans. Um, but there's still, that, that was a difference in the, the clothing market. Same thing with the Walkman. I mean, cassette, cassette tapes were allowed around a long time before the Walkman, but um, Sony figured out how to make it portable, basically, and that's a major difference. Um, decaf coffee, honestly, like, um, it's the exact same coffee. There's just a certain process to go through to like to get the caffeine out of the plants, um, and but it's otherwise it's the exact same thing. You're growing the same plant. You're just making a tiny little tweak to get the caffeine out, and then flip top cans. It's the same drink in the same container. It just goes like this instead of like back when uh, back when. I, back when I was a kid, you like pull off a, a top, and then normally you drop it in the can um, because it was just convenient to put it there. Put it there, and then there's always a certain number of stories each year of people choking on pop tops because they swallowed them from the can. Wait, uh, you put those things in? Yep. Yeah. You yeah. Like in your drink? Like yeah. You would pull it off and then throw it in the drink. I throw my drink away when in that thing goes in there. Like I didn't know people did that. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. So, but you know, just just coming up with the pop top so that you don't have anything you have to throw away, major innovation, pretty much the most basic change possible. Everything else about the product it comes in the same can. All you did is change how the top opens. Um, and then, um, finally, when you're talking about innovations, you want to. There's two different types of classification or looking at innovation. One is from the customer's or consumer's point of view, and the other is from the firm's point of view. So I've got a, um, for in, in terms of the customer's point of view, this is a nice like chart, again, from the same textbook that I, I pulled some stuff out of that I, every basically starting next week, starting as soon as this slide is over and I bring out a couple of mine, um, everything else for the rest of the, the semester is my material. But I kind of wanted to push myself to, to bring some stuff in here that I thought I think I, I thought it was under uh, uh, under addressing. So this is from the same textbook that I've uh, I've used for other stuff, and this is describing from the consumer point of view. So innovation from the consumer point of view is basically about what does it do to change how you behave as the person using that product. Like, is it basically just that it made it easier to open the the, the top, or is there something? majorly different about how, like, I, my entire life is different using the internet. I, I, I do things that I never would have done. 
without the internet because it was never what I never would have conceived that it's possible. Um, so that's a major change in how everybody in the planet lives. Um, pop top cans are basically a very minor change in like it's it, it's a slightly different like you know you have to use slightly different muscles <laughs> to pull the top as opposed to pop it, but otherwise there's no behavior change necessary. Uh, and then from the firm point of view, um, you want to you want to think about how new is the market and how new is the product. And a lot of times entrepreneurship people will talk about how new is the technology, but technology to me sort of implies high tech and implies like the technology in, in, in your guys case is like providing a safe nurturing environment for kids. That's it's not really technological, but that's that's what they mean when they say technology. What's the product and what's the market and how new is each one? And there's a nice little chart here talking about sort of ways to categories. You, you, you know, you could have a really new market and a really new product. You could have the exact same product and a totally new market, and there are different ways of organizing the business and the next steps for the, uh, the, the entrepreneurial plan, depending on which box they fall into. Uh, product planning and development. Um, so, you know, it's 503. I'm gonna just leave this one for you guys to read. I don't feel overly strong about this. I think the point, I've got one more, by the way, before everybody goes, there's a slide that I wanted to show. It's my own material. That, and it has to do with innovation and differentiation, okay? So this is a, this is a good one. I'm gonna leave that for later. Let me pull up the other slide while we still got a few minutes left. Okay, so there's three slides here, and then I got one other one to pull up after this, and then we call it a day. So um, I, I love this story, and I want to, like, please, everybody quiet and, and, and pay attention for a second. Um, I talked about this, I think, in the, the intro um, to, to entrepreneurship, but I want to dive into a slightly like, greater extent because there was a great example of how to do new idea generation that one of my clients from the music business went through. So, um, and basically the, th the idea is to challenge your assumptions. And it's a relatively simple exercise. List them, record a differing viewpoint, reverse whatever the assumption, like uh, reverse your assumption based on what the differing viewpoint was and then figure out how you could actually implement those upside down reversed assumptions. And, and you'd be surprised what happens. So in the music business, this really, this really happened. This is actually, this is, this is how record labels survived and how they moved from the business model of yesterday to the business model of today. So the old assumption was that record labels sell records to consumers. That's what, that's what, record, that's what record companies did. That's what music businesses did since 1900. They would record music, they'd put it in some kind of physical like package, and they'd sell it to individual people who would then listen to it and they have fun enjoying listening to it. That's not the world we live in anymore. So if you reverse those viewpoints, record labels don't have to sell records. They can sell other things besides recorded music. And they don't have to sell to consumers. There's all kinds of different groups that they could sell to or target markets of one kind or another. So if you reverse those assumptions, record labels could sell music in other formats. Could be MP3, could be just the publishing rights. There's no physical recording whatsoever, et cetera, et cetera. And you could sell it to businesses rather than selling it to consumers. So if you put all that together, record labels could sell background music for corporate advertisers. And basically, that is the way you make good money in the music business these days. And I, I, I have a nice little like illustration here. Um, this is an album from an artist named Nicola Conte um, from a label called Schema Records out of uh, Milan, Italy. Great. Um, just, that's weird. 
Huh? What's that? No, it's not a friend of mine who wrote it. But it was a, it was a, a record label that represents this artist. The client of mine, I have a I represented them. So, so it's, it's fun music. It's kind of like a jazz, loungy kind of mix. Yeah, fun, fun stuff. However, Okay, this, this is just a regular traditional album. It sold about 10,000 units. That is a great number of units for an independent jazz record in the year 2000, which is when it came out. Yeah, it's a great, great, that's a great success story. In round numbers, let's say that made about 100 grand in revenues. Um, and after you get done subtracting all of the, the costs of producing, of distribution, of, of manufacturing, uh, of artist royalties, etc., it probably yielded 20 to 30 percent profit. So, 20 to 30 percent, 20 to 30 thousand dollars of profit for the record label off of this 10,000 units of sales. However, there's no way they can ever sell that number of units again. People just don't buy records anymore. They were lucky enough to do that in 2000. So, if we go back here, forget about downloading it. They went with the new. The, 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 they went with that like exercise that I just mentioned of, of talking about what it's selling music to corporate advertisers. So this is what that album became. And w when I get done playing these two clips for you, I'll actually tell you what the economics of the, the new situation were. So that was one, that was 30 seconds from one track off of the album. There are 18 tracks on that album. Each one is about six minutes long. So 18 times 18 is, what is that? 20, it's about, yeah, it, it should, uh, it, like, well, 18 times 20 would be 360. So. It's going to be, it's going to be you know, like 330, 340 or something. Um, that's, um, that's one 340th of the album. And they sold, they got paid 50 grand for that Kmart spot. Um, and since there was no manufacturing, there were no manufacturing costs whatsoever involved in that. All they had to do was license the music. They still had to pay somebody like me who, like brokered the deal. Unfortunately, I didn't broker that one, so I didn't get to have a, like, I didn't get ten thousand bucks off that because that's what that would have been my commission if I had been, like, brokering the deal. But that one wasn't mine. Um, but after that, they still have. You know, they've got about thirty left over, maybe twenty-five. They've got almost a fifty percent or above profit margin where they used to have twenty to thirty, yeah. and. It's a fraction of the cost. So, just by reversing those assumptions, they really, really like, like change the nature of how music uh, business runs. There's another one here. Um, another one here for Acura. I won't. I, I, I like. We're getting close on time. Uh, there's one thing, and more thing I wanted to show you. So, the slides are up here. If you're interested in seeing the uh, the, the 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 video or the rest of listen to the rest of the tracks. Heaven forbid, if you wanted to order a copy of this. It's a great album. You'll be glad you have it. <laughs> um, they still sell it. They got you know maybe fifty copies sitting on the shelf. Every every once in a while, somebody wants to order one. So um, you could also download it. I'm sure off of iTunes, the whole album. Um, anyway, okay. So the last thing I wanted to point out is just a little bit of a uh, it's a little bit of a roadmap for where we're going next. Um, you remember I talked in the beginning of the very first class session about modular business planning? And then I basically didn't talk about business plans anymore and I just talked about um, 
how important it is to get out and talk to customers right away, to build a website right away and talk to expert advisors? Well, that's because of how that fits into this. And going forward next week, the deliverables that we're putting together are basically the stuff on this list, okay? But I want it put together in a modular way. Like, depending on who you're talking to, investors might want to know, show me the product, you know? Show me the, 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 the prototype, show me the demo. If I believe, if I can see this damn thing fly, I'll invest in it. And they don't even really care to see the financials. Other people want to see the financials and they have no desire to actually watch the this, this, this silly thing fly. They just want to know how much money it's going to make. So you don't want to have this thing in a big 150, 200 page document. You want to people to be able to basically click on a hyperlink and read whichever one of these they want. So going forward in successive weeks, um, elevator pitch. A lot of you in here have heard that. It's basically a 30 second to one minute spiel which summarizes everything in here it's it's the highlights what is so cool about this business in 30 seconds and it doesn't actually go in the plan per se but it is the way that the entire business plan is summarized uh executive summary is basically one level deeper um, of that kind of ex like summarizing the rest of the areas uh, of the business plan uh product the reason i said that uh, website and web development is so important is because if you don't have a website there's no way to actually represent the damn product to people. Um, and every business plan needs to describe the product. The sooner you get started building that website, the sooner you're able to identify what people actually resonate with and what they don't get about your product. And you, the faster you get to describing it in a way that is gonna resonate with people. Customer analysis, that's the next part of any major business plan. That's why I said go out and talk to customers first. You could go out and do all kinds of research on how many people there are in different demographic groups until you have an actual potential customer who tells you, this is what I want, this is what I'd be willing to pay for. All of this is, no pun intended, just an academic exercise. Um, competition and market environment. Um, there's a lot of sort of details there, but one of the things that you're gonna ask, and we'll go through that when I, when I do my section on customer analysis, one of the things you're gonna ask beta customers is, who do you use right now? Who's the competition right now? And that's the same thing you're gonna ask expert advisors. Who's gonna, like some of the expert advisors may actually be your competitors. Not every competitor is necessarily like out to kill you. They, they, they just have already been there. They might actually benefit from you coming in because it knocks off somebody bigger on the block. Um, but. The expert advisors and the, 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 the sample customers are gonna tell you who the competition is, and then you can go out and do all this fancy research on the rest of the competition, but you can do a whole lot of research on companies who actually aren't your true competitors if you don't ask experts and customers first. Um, financials, most of what I have you get from customers when you talk to them are numbers that you need to know in order to calculate the financials. There, I, there are so many people that I went to MBA with that could run beautiful looking spreadsheets that look like have big dollar numbers in, on them and they, they look really fancy. They're not based in reality. It's just, it's just a, an exercise of people that like to crunch numbers, crunching numbers. Until you've asked somebody who's a real potential customer, how much would you pay for this? Really? And you look them in the eye and you know, based on that talk, that they're not kidding. They would be. They would pay this, but not this. Once you know that, then your financial projections are real. Uh, and then finally, implementation plan and what I like to call the sales plan. But it's not the sales plan for the biz, for the product. It's a sales plan for the entire business, uh, and that's about investor outreach. So um, we'll talk about all of these various topics in successive weeks. Now, everybody who is not a software person go and the software people i just have one a couple quick things to tell you and i'll email you with a summary of everything okay
work on several different apps all together, or we can split you into separate groups. I will summarize all this, including what the nature of the projects are, email you. Think about it between now and next week, how you want to organize the group, okay? You mean about construction uh, stuff? Yeah, I just want to talk to you about all that. Everybody well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in her. I got plenty of yeah. stuff going on, so yeah. whenever you come by, I'm happy to help, yes. but yes. it's more like you and your brother's time. Your brother, right? Brother-in-law. Yeah. Brother. So it's more you and your brother's timeline than mine, so come by come whenever you want. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Martin. Uh, it should be the gentleman that came here earlier, Ryan. Uh-huh. So I got his contact information.